we go. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about pronunciation problems that Polish learners have. So I'll start off with a very typical minimal pair that they have trouble with, and it's one that particularly concerns me because one of the sounds is in my name. Um, so when Slavic learners generally or Germanic learners meet me for the first time, if they've never heard the name Sandy before, they tend to call me Sandy with an F sound and not an A sound. Um, and uh, this difficulty with pronouncing A um, can also mean that they might mishear my name and think I'm called Sunday because that's the English word that's closest to what they know. So either a, a, a are like three sounds that they mix up. So I'm going to show you specifically two sounds. I'm going to show you a and a. Um, and uh, so uh, this, this diagram is from tree or three. You don't necessarily have to use diagrams with your students, but sometimes it can be useful. But the bit that I want to show you that can help is the mouth shapes. Um, so like the, the shape of your lips. Um, so if you take your index finger and put it on your nose and take your thumb and put it on your chin. Um, and so that you've got kind of two points touching and then you say eh, ah, eh, ah, eh, ah. you should be able to feel that when you say sound two. Your, your fingers are wider apart and your mouth is like more open. So, eh, ah, eh, ah. And then seeing the tongue diagram, that, that's easy for students to see and to feel. When you see the tongue diagram, if you then repeat it and go and think about where is your tongue when you make each sound, eh, ah, eh, ah. And can you feel your tongue kind of moving down and slightly back for the second sound compared to the first sound? Have a go and see if you can feel it for yourself. Um. <clears throat> can you feel it? Can you feel the difference? Yeah. So this is what Adrian Underhill calls pro. Well, not just Adrian Underhill. It's this is the technical term is proprioception. It's the awareness of the movement of what's happening in your mouth. <coughs> And if you can help learners to be aware, aware of the physical movements, then they'll be able to make the sounds. If you just keep going to them, eh, ah, eh, ah, eh, ah, <coughs> they can't see it and they can't hear it. I'm really sorry. I inevitably lose my voice when I'm going to do a talk and especially when I'm going to do a pronunciation talk, sorry. <clears throat> so that's the first step is to use, use your fingers and use diagrams to help the students to kind of feel the difference between the sounds. Oh dear, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so once you've introduced the sound in isolation and you've shown the students the difference, the next thing you can work with is minimal pairs. So a minimal pair is a word where a single sound has changed to make a different word. Um, it can be with vowels like this, like the difference between pen, pan, or it can be with um, consonants, like the difference between uh, ban, pan, or pen, ben. That distinction, for example, is difficult for Arabic learners, the difference between per and but. Um, <coughs> and you can have this simple uh, listen and repeat, n, an, x, x, pen, pan. But what I like to do is I say one of the words and the students have to show me, is it number one or number two? Yeah. So for example, if I say x, is it one or two? X. Um, or pen. Thank you, Gareth and Emma, for playing along. <laughs> 
Um, and once I've done it a few times, I'll turn my back to the learners. I won't do it to you now because you won't be able to hear me. But I'll turn my back so they can't see my mouse when I'm doing it. They can only hear me. And then they have to say again, is it one or two? And then I put them in pairs to practice with a partner. And if they think they've said two, but their partner thinks they've said one, then they have to think about what do they need to move differently in their mouth or how do they need to change their pronunciation to produce the correct sound? Because it could be a listening or a production problem once the students are doing it in pairs. <clears throat> you can then step that up a bit by using Pronunciation Journey, which is an activity from Mark Hancock. Um, originally it appeared in the book Pronunciation Games, which is a fantastic uh, resource book, but it's actually now freely available on the Hancock MacDonald website, which has lots of really useful pronunciation resources. So um, and you start your journey at point number one, and I will say a word which either has an a or an a in it, and each time you go either left or right, and then at the end you have to tell me which city we've ended up in. Okay, so are you ready? Yeah. Okay, um, Anne. Um, pan. Men. Bed. So where are we? What do you think? I think I'm in Mexico City. Do you agree with Gareth? I think we're in Mexico City. Yeah. I'll say the same set one more time. So, an, pan, men, bed. Do you agree, Mexico City? Mexico City. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So the students can do that and it gives them like, it gives them a reason to produce these separate sounds. And it helps them also again to notice, is it a production problem or a reception problem? Uh, okay, so that's the first kind of set of things when you're distinguishing between two different sounds. Um, the next one <clears throat> is a really minor pronunciation thing. It's not a big difference. I just think it's really interesting for students to know about, and it can help you to think about why, how does it make people sound accented? This is also a thing that happens again with people who speak Spanish. Uh, with people who speak uh, German, I believe it's the same as well. So it's it's a problem across a lot of different groups. Uh, that is that is I misremembered what was next. Sorry, I'll come on to that in a second. Um, so another thing that you can do to help your students is teach them like common spelling patterns. So if you don't know about it already, in the back pages of English file, they have this fantastic summary of common spelling patterns. So it shows you the normal spelling. So for example, for E, it's E, 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 A, or just the letter E. But it also shows you some really common exceptions that make that sound. Um, when I was teaching in the Czech Republic, I had a pre-intermediate uh, student whose spelling was basically Czech English. Um, she just used to write all of her like letters as if it was Czech spelling. And she went away independently and taught herself this over the course of about six weeks and her spelling just improved leaps and bounds. So especially if you have like a low level one to one or a low level group, this can be a really useful thing to build their confidence and just to help them to make those sound spelling connections because pronunciation is also a reading and a writing issue. It's not just a speaking and a listening issue. And it's those sound spelling relationships that can really help them. Um, and particularly focusing on sounds that are different in Polish and English, where the spelling is different. So for example, the fact that um, CH is normally pronounced K or CH in English, whereas in Polish it's pronounced F. So it's not chemistry, but chemistry. Or my students were trying to say hurt the other day and we were learning church. They, my, you know, my beginner teens were trying to say hurt. And I was like, I can't even make that sound. <laughs> um, so yeah, help them with those sound spelling connections. Yes, okay. So the next thing, um, this is this minor one I was talking about. So in um, Polish, uh, the and the 
are dental. So this means that your tongue touches the back of your teeth when you say them. But in English, they're alveolar. And so your alveolar ridge is the, the skin that goes from the top of your teeth, like back in your mouth to the roof of your mouth. And in English, we touch our tongue to the alveolar ridge, not our teeth, when we say t, d, n. And so it's a small difference, but the difference between, for example, t, d, n, versus t, d, n. And if students can't hear that difference, they might not be able to pick out sounds in a stream. I think that's more important for lower level students to be able to differentiate um, because higher level students can probably use context to pick up on the words. But anyway, I think that's an interesting thing that, that in English and Polish, those consonant sounds are different because we normally focus so much on vowel sounds. Uh, okay, so the next thing um, is intonation. So this is the classic one that we all know about. Um, that uh, in Polish and in a lot of Slavic languages, intonation tends to be a lot flatter. Um, and we know that the students can then potentially will sound bored or disinterested when they're saying things to us. Um, and for somebody who hasn't worked with Polish students a lot or isn't familiar with this, they might think that the student is being or the person is being deliberately rude to them because they're saying these, you know, flat, bored, disinterested tones. Um, and students, Polish students might not want to copy our intonation patterns because to them it might sound crazy or over exaggerated. And this is often more true of men than women, because generally men have a narrower uh, intonation range in, in any language than women do. And so Polish men, especially if they have a female teacher, might be really reluctant to copy those patterns because they may think it makes them sound feminine. So in pronunciation and intonation, things like this, they, they can be an emotional and an identity thing not just a pure mechanical thing. So one thing you can do to help students is to show the intonation that you're using. So I just recorded this on my phone on Friday. So English is me and Polish is Sandra, who's our receptionist. And with the question, you can see that our intonation is fairly similar, but my, my range is bigger. So I, I start and then I, I narrow to a point, as it were, and Sandra does the same thing. But the second one, so I was saying, can you speak English? Can you speak English? Can you speak English? And Sandra's range was much narrower. But then the second one, this is an exclamation. Hello, hello. And Sandra's intonation was much, much narrower. So again, although she came to a point, she didn't start with that exaggerated intonation. So I, I just used the video recorder, on, the audio recorder on my phone and it gave us these patterns. If you want um, a clearer version of this, then you could use something called Audacity, um, which is a free audio editor that you can download. Um, and that shows really clear contours and you can space out the timing on it. So, um, so you can make like you can make the intonation curve much longer. So here you can see kind of one second, but you can make it so that you can see one second much, you know, much longer. So it's showing you in like millisecond increments as well. So you can really see the contour pattern. And the challenge here when students can see the intonation patterns, the challenge then is to get them to try to imitate it again and again until they can get this kind of intonation pattern and that's something that students can do themselves at home as well there you go that's my whistle stop tour of three or four things that you can do with uh to help like polish students with uh some of these intonation patterns and some of these um tips or problems that they have anything that anyone wants to add or ask thanks for the comment for that No? 
<laughs> well, hopefully that was useful. That's the end of that.